Very good crowd. Thank you so much. Um, good morning. Um, I'll start just by framing this a little bit. We looked at what you judges are having to face today and we were a little bit worried about you. Five, <laughs> five presentations, half an hour each, Q&A, all on one topic, transport, yes, can you enjoy the coffee? You'll stay awake. Um, so we decided that, look, death by PowerPoint claims a lot of lives every year and we're not going to do it. We're going to do it a little bit differently and we've decided to present our solution as an episode of an ABC Current Affairs show. So something like Q&A meets Four Corners meets the project. Now, to get around the restraining audience, that injunction didn't stick, did it? No, yeah, good. We've decided to call it Three Corners. So, and uh, we've decided also for narrative purposes to set it two years into the future. To give ourselves a little bit more of an insight, we can look backwards and tell a bit of the story. Before we get into that, a quick word about how we define the problem. We looked at sort of fully integrated transport solution for the hunter and thought, well, how do we distill that down to success? How do we um, really solidify that? And we boiled it down to reducing single occupant car journeys for environmental, economic, parking, livability, all kinds of reasons. And so that was a big part of our definition of success. Off that, we came up with a couple of insights and those insights led on to the development of a couple of solutions. The first thing we looked at was to smash the silos between passenger and freight. We view the passenger and freight dichotomy as a hangover from the Industrial Revolution, uh, somewhat redundant in today's world. Secondly, to make transportation hubs modelled on Wickham, uh, where buses, cars, vans, trains, light rail, heavy rail would all come together. Um, and thirdly, to invent a cool application, an app in your phone that would bring it all together. Okay? So, and the app is to be called Mungai. Um, so everybody please get comfortable, suspend disbelief, come two years into the future with us and uh, into a journey to the ABC Studios of 2018. Good evening and welcome to Three Corners. Today is the 31st of October 2018. I'm your host, Oliver York. Tonight we'll discuss the Trump presidency, now nearly two years old, and of course the foreign policy implications, including the recent US airstrikes on Canada and worldwide reaction. But first we'll examine the Mungai phenomenon, the transport solution that was laughed at as impossible, then seen as an ingenious idea, and is now of course an indispensable part of all of our daily lives and those of billions of people around the world. Uh, sure, Mungai has transformed our lives, but is it entirely for the better? How did we get here? Where did it come from? Joining me on the panel tonight is uh, Jay Nicholas, economist and visiting fellow from Oxford University in the UK. Thank you, Jay. Senator Liz Brown, the Deputy Assistant Minister assisting the Special Minister of State for Administrative Affairs. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Simon Battersby, Head of Transport Engineering at PHP, couldn't be here if his helicopter broke down. He sends his apologies. He better. And, of course, the man needing no introduction, he went from humble engineer to multi-millionaire seemingly overnight. Please welcome the inventor of Mungai, Mr. John Thorburn. <laughs> and, of course, way back in 2016, the potential for Mungai was realised. Uh, people everywhere very quickly came to believe this was something special. And uh, let's take a look at what people had to say. Mungai. Mungai. Who is this guy that created this? This is fantastic. This could change my life. No. This could change the world. I always thought that the weekend in the change was a great idea. But incorporating the hunter on time helps. But then, uh, when my time came on board, and the mate told me about this Mungai app, I looked into that and uh, it kind of seemed like a double win. Okay, very good. So we know it's amazing. Uh, people were excited about it even back in 16. But what is it and where did it come from? Now, John, I understand you studied interpretive dance before you were an inventor, or was it French poetry? And then, uh, was there a lightning strike? How did it come to be? Well, it started on a relatively uneventful wet day in Newcastle. I was studying third year engineering and was supposed to be heading out to a friend's place for a party that night. 
not wanting to drive and being down to eating two minute noodles until my hip allowance came in, my only choice was the public transport system. And as anyone who lived in Newcastle back then knows, the bus system was useless, going a long way to everywhere. And I wasn't in the mood for standing out in the rain waiting for a bus for who knows how long. So necessity was another invention then that drove this development? Oh, sort of, Ollie. Uh, you know, I was just bracing myself to head out into the rain and my phone went off. It was a good mate of mine that worked for ABC Couriers. He had his last drop off for the day down the road and offered me a lift. We're heading out to his place at Waratah to catch the train into uh, the party. And I noticed mm -hmm. the same thing about every vehicle on the road. Mm -hmm. There was only one person on board, the driver. So I asked him whether he thought about taking paying passengers. He said, nah, it's just too hard. How would you manage it? Even if you went with Uber, you've got to be in two spots at once. So you were looking at it as an opportunity to sort of break down the barriers between passenger and freight in a nutshell? Yeah. Um, you know, I was, my was ticking over it. You know, there'd been more news in the um, recently about the drop in numbers on the Newcastle buses again and the Australia Post Financial coming out saying that they're losing money on the mail service again. But if I'm going to be honest, any thought of world peace, let alone solving Newcastle's transport woes, probably got buried under one heck of a party that night. Yeah, it sounds like it was a good time. Um, so, just to summarise where you sat, like we had people standing in the rain waiting for transport at the same time as we had empty seats driving around in crew vans and passenger buses. I know, it seemed silly, but that was life. About two months later, I heard of a, about the future transport program the government was running, and it started me thinking again. I went back to this idea of how can we use all these empty seats to help people get around? How do we spend less and get more? I ended up concluding the only one way was to merge these two markets, the passenger and this small freight market, mm. into one big system. Because let's be honest, for most people, we don't care whether it's a bus, a train, a tram, a cab, a car, Uber, or a courier van. Mm. Get us there on time and cheap. To pull it off, we needed a one-stop shop preferably in your hand, and the idea of the long day out was formed. Very, very good. All right, and then making that a reality, you had your idea. Did you, uh, how, did you get, how did you make it real? Was it Silicon Valley Venture Funds? Did any of the brilliant local investor groups like I know, Wright's House show an interest, for instance? Well, while working on the prototype, I got the opportunity to attend the Hunt and Our Future Leaders program and meet the Coordinator General for Transport. Oh, uh, yeah, that's an amazing <laughs> program. Yeah, only I mean, truly exceptional people get selected, but it's the wisdom of the judges that really sets them apart. No doubt, it's about innovation and quality. Mm. Anyway, this program unlocked so many doors for us and opened up pathways for the concept and prototype had to be taken seriously mm. as a solution for the Newcastle's transport problems. A few months later, Hunter on Time was launched to provide a corporate identity and to handle the development of the new hubs that we believe needed to be there to maximise the benefit from the concept. Mm. I was running the app development program and um, the next six months were hell. No sleep, lots of stress, definitely no life, but it was worth it as the rollout went better than expected. It's not to say there weren't bugs and naysayers, but we didn't shut down power to a whole state either. Within six months, we had 200,000 users and single car person, single person car journeys, sorry, were down 5%. We had succeeded. Since then, we've been handling interest from all over the world. Last week, we went live in Shanghai. Next week, it's Dublin. And there's plenty of interest from regional centres across the US. Okay, very good. And that's rolling out the next 12 months, I understand. That's an astonishing journey. John, now you make a very important point about Hunter on Time, that system of transport hubs. For those viewers who aren't familiar, can we give them some understanding? Here we are on the site of the new Wickham Interchange and the influence of the Hunter on Time team on this development has allowed for a complete mixed mode transport solution. And what do I mean by mixed mode? It's heavy rail, light rail, buses, taxi, Uber, cars, courier vans and bikes. And of course we're only a stone's throw away from the cruise terminal on the water. The Wickham site is one of a series of hubs. We've already completed the Glendale, Stadium and Bathers Way hubs. Wickham is completing its final stage now, and then the team will move on to the airport, completing the intermodal hub at Beresfield and also the Upper Hunter hubs. This will allow for a complete system of hubs to be in action, offering a number of different transport solutions at a greater frequency to the customers in a safe and secure way. It's a truly integrated transport solution for Newcastle and the Hunter region. Very good, and I must say, your twin brother did an outstanding job there. Uh, second cousin um, twice for a reason. Advanced partner too, I understand. Uh, 
Um, it's certainly very innovative. Dave, um, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Oxford. Oh, Ollie, can um, I just interrupt you? Yeah. We've just I'll spoken just about the real world hub, mate, but the oh, yeah. IT engine that makes the uh, Mungo technology work is also something new. Oh, yeah, We've brilliant. blended existing technologies uh, with uh, our own intellectual property to pull together all the offerings and uh, apps and databases that all our current providers use, yeah. your cab companies, your Uber drivers, your courier vans, to make it work on a new app screen. It looks simple, but there was a lot of programming time. Trust me. Now we even interface to the uh, Bureau of Meteorology. So not only do we know when it's raining, but our uh, suppliers know what to expect when people's behaviour changes when it gets wet. Okay, very good. And Jade, your thoughts on what that means for us all economically? Yeah, thanks, Oliver. Look, um, Mungai has certainly smashed the, the silos when mm. it comes to the transport and logistics world. Areas that have previously operated, you know, in, by themselves at a great expense are now working together and saving millions of dollars. These changes have opened up competition between providers which, while regulated, are offering a great variety to the consumer, which is showing to be you know, a great increase. People who previously used you know, Gumtree and eBay, for example, to sell products are now able to use the Mungai app to have their products sent out rather than having to have people come to their homes to pick up the items. It's also streamlined the way that goods are delivered through to Newcastle and the Hunter. You know, the hubs were designed in such a way that products can be sent by the most direct route. Okay, and so that sounds great in the abstract. Can you walk us through, for example, a real world example? Yeah, sure. Let's look at um, a courier driver that's taking a parcel from Newcastle to Maitland, for example. And, mm -hmm. You know, parcels are a small one kilo parcel. Just in a van. Yep. Just in a van. The you know, courier would charge $22 for that parcel delivery, and out of that, they make about $7. Okay, so the margins are skinny. Yep. Certainly. So that's the point. Like with Mungai, that, that driver can also pick up a passenger and they can charge the passenger $15 for the trip. Mm -hmm. The passenger's happy because $15 is a fairly reasonable price. The parcel gets delivered. You know, the driver makes an additional $15 on that trip, taking their profit from $7 to $22. The multiply effect across many, many trips and passengers, it's an economic win-win. Yeah, my mate, the courier driver, definitely saw it that way. He was an early adopter. Maybe after a few carbs were passed across the table to make him pick up. But <laughs> and it's a win for the environment as well. I think that's mm. something really important that we need to touch on, Oliver. Um, sustainability and the impact on the environment was a key focus for the development of the hot hubs. And who wouldn't be happy with that as an impact? Okay. Yeah, you make a very good point there, Senator. Um, can we see how the app works? John, have you got a uh, demo? You can so we've got a couple of screenshots we can show. Yep. So, like the home, home pages. Designed to be simple, we provide the user lots of functionality. So at the top, like most apps, you can go and put in where you want to start, where you want to finish. It's you know straightforward. Or you can use the uh, compass to find where you really want. In the middle, we've got all your favourites, all your regular journeys. You don't want to have to enter that data every time. It's too taxing. And just in case you've done something different, your last trips are down the bottom, which are easy to use. Once you hit the go button, that's when the magic really starts. Back in the background, the crunching's done and up come your options. Depending on exactly uh, which operators you're working with and uh, the mix of modes you're using will depend on the price and also your timing. What I think is really innovative though is uh, this offer available button. So if you're uh, you know, not on a high priority, you don't mind, you know, you're at home Saturday morning, you just want to make it down the shops, you don't care whether you leave at 8 or 10, hit the offer available button and it'll find the cheapest time and cheapest way for you rather than uh, you happen to pick a designated time. Last, we, we're not aiming to take over from uh, these existing businesses. Their existing point-to-point -point services are still available through the app. One of the other things we really like is the uh, map function. You can see all the major stops and uh, the details built in there that you can see what services are available at those hubs. That's great, John. Do you mind if I tell a bit of the backstory of the name, Mungo? I think it's very important. Go for it, John. Yeah, Mungai is an indigenous word for lightning, and I think it's very evocative in terms of the speed and power of which Mungai and the hot hub is trying to convey. It's certainly catchy as well. That logo has become just like the Nike swoosh, the C of Coca-Cola and the F of Facebook, and that's a very vivid, vivid green. It's the simplicity of use that, that's a major plus. It's the reason I started using it and introduced my technophobe mother to, to the software. <laughs> now she uses it all the time. But seriously, in addition to breaking down the silos, we've also seen Mungai open up the gateway of Newcastle to the rest of the world. Mm, 
Yeah, you, you know, Newcastle is such a beautiful place and there's so many different things to come and see and do, but with previous transport modes it used to be very difficult to get out to some of these locations. Yeah, and so then, how is it different now then, Jade? Well, visitors that now arrive to the city can arrive by air, by sea, on a cruise liner or by train, and they know that once they're here, they're not going to need to hire a car, they're going to be able to use the, the transport system to get around. This has meant a huge influx of tourism over just the last 12 months in Newcastle, which it's only set to continue as we grow further and further and we have more events like the supercars and other big events coming to town. Very good. And that, I mean, that's great for the tourists, but uh, what about for local battlers? Yeah, look, jobs. It's created additional jobs. Employment prospects have increased noticeably with the introduction of Mungai. Not only have jobs been in, you know, created in that transport and logistics field, but you know, we're also looking at retail, tourism and hospitality as we continue to meet demand and, and meet the revitalisation of the city. And you know, in the past 12 months, we've seen a, an influx of Newcastle and Hunter people that live Locals. here that mm -hmm. used to avoid coming into town because of parking and transport. And they now can get into the, the city quickly and easily. And they can come and visit the beach for the day and any of the new boutiques and coffee shops that are popping up and down. It really has been a huge contributor to the economic growth of the region. Yeah, and we do see that in the youth unemployment figures. I understand they're down from about 14% in 2016, uh, down to about 11% now. Yep. But exactly. what about the real people? What every time this technological change? Let's look at the, what about the losers from the technological change? Let's hear from them. Oh, don't talk to me about this moonlight. I've been driving cabs for 20 years and Mungo's going to wipe me out completely. Mungo makes travel way too easy. It's too many options for people. My taxi plane's worth $250,000. That was my retirement fund. What can I do with that now? Uh, hi, my name's Trano. I'm posted from Charlestown. Um, all anyone can talk about before on Mungo is the scaredness of them losing their jobs. Um, and I'm worried about where I'll be if Australia Post doesn't pick this thing anymore. Mm. Yeah, Jade's right to point to the innovation being uh, one of the main drivers of economic growth in the region. Uh, but what's also important to remember here is it's the people that matter most. Mm. That's what we're really seeing with the impact of Hot, Hot and Mungo. Uh, initial concerns raised appear to be unfounded and concerned with loss of jobs, uh, changes and damages to the environment, and concerns with safety, not just personal safety but also credit card safety. Uh, in fact, Oliver, I would question the age of the clips that you've just shown. Yeah, well, I mean, I admit those are back from back in 2016, but surely those are real concerns. Stage, that doesn't sound like the ABC at all. <laughs> uh, we know that the changes that Hot Mungo have brought to the Hunter region uh, and Newcastle far outweigh the negatives associated with the changes in job structure. What's more, it's the people who benefit again. It's an increasing competition for taxi drivers and postal delivery. It's led to an extremely competitive market. You agree, Jay? Yeah, that's typically the case around the world. Mm. More options, lower prices for consumers. I should disclose that I was involved earlier in the project as an expert consultant on a macro and microeconomic modelling, and it has proven to exceed the feasibility study. In fact, ta taxpayer funding for New South Wales Trainlink, for example, was $540 million in 2015, and it's now dropped by 5%. Mm. You know, we've also seen falls in waiting times at key modes and lower average prices per trip. Okay, it sounds like consumers are winning. What about the overall effects, big picture then, beyond the economy? We live in a society after all, not economy, right Senator? Valid point. The, the overall benefits for the economy, economy have translated directly into the social benefits for the community as well. And it's an improvement to people's lives. And we're talking about lower congestion for road users, fewer single car trips, therefore less carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. It's a great story in terms of the environment more readily available public transport options and better health for the community from increased activity. That was actually an unexpected but a really positive outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important as well, particularly for the elderly. Um, it's also delivered options for part-time workers, increased community relations and social interactions between community members. To Jade's point about employment, the job losses expected have been minor and have translated more to a changing role in jobs rather than a loss of employment as a whole. For example, postmen are now delivery drivers. In both, for both freight and people. Taxi drivers are now postal deliveries. It's more of a blurring of those separate roles rather than actual loss of employment. Well, so that's our taxi driver lady. She was certainly not happy. And, uh, yeah, that's out. true. And I absolutely understand the concern totally. But on the other side of the argument, let me tell you about one of my constituents, sure. Beryl. She's a delightfully young 70-year-old lady. She started using Mungai, actually just to do a weekly grocery trip. 
And she discovered the, the wonderful button that John pointed out, the options available, offers available. She's discovered that you've got the option to save on your trip by riding along with a passing courier who might be heading in the same direction, mm. instead of paying for an expensive cab. Now, initially, Beryl was limited to the convenient deliveries that were local, but she's actually now stretching a little further afield on shopping day within the hub network, and she uses it as a form of social interaction. As you can see here, it's the integration of these two platforms together which really benefit Beryl. And these are the benefits we're already seeing now in 2018. Who knows what will happen when we start looking at driverless cars? Well, John, is that the same? It most certainly is. Funnily enough, our California team's already working with both Google and Uber and looking at the impacts of that. But even in Western Australia, there's a Perth pilot of uh, driverless minibuses that's looking very promising and being able to be integrated. Fantastic, and what a promising moment to end our episode on tonight. There appears to be no limit to the future of development of the Mungai phenomenon. And I, for one, am gratified that the uh, HunterNet Future Leaders Program helped deliver such an outstanding outcome. What a program that must be. Uh, can you all please join me in thanking tonight's guests, Jay, John, Liz and Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, look, in all seriousness, our solution provider, we believe, is a truly integrated transport solution for Newcastle and the Hunter region. Essentially, it's got two parts. The first is the hub. What we're trying to do here is to latch on to the idea of the Wigger Mint change model and actually increase the amount of modes offered within that, that solution. We're also creating a network of hubs that then connect the entire region. It's about changing that hub model to hunt on time, allowing people and passengers to choose their own transport solution in any number of options available and combine them, because it really doesn't matter how. Secondly is the Mungai app. This is the platform in your hand that pulls it all together. Passengers and freight can access the modes available and get from A to B using multiple types of transport. Mungai aims to integrate technology into the way that we engage, foster innovation, build international profile and attract talent to our region. This is completely in line with the Newcastle 2030 strategic plan. Finally, both, of course, both the hub and Mungai is actually available and transferable anywhere around the world and to emerging technologies such as driverless cars. We now welcome your questions. Uh, I, I had, I think you touched on it uh, as part of the presentation, um, and I experienced this on the way in this morning. You talked about wet weather, but for example, if there's an accident, um, there's a significant delay on a particular arterial route, does the smart app also take that into account and then can reroute and optimise so around yes, that? Yeah, would expect it to. And given the yeah. ability and the fact that it can actually tap in, it's already a platform which links with using the Moolu engine, which is yeah. the sort of overarching platform we've got, because it already taps into those different cars, the taxi apps, the cab apps, the, or the BOM, um, in terms of the weather and all those sorts of things. Um, given the fact that we've got RMS um, available data, the, the, the intention is that that would then link it to that as well um, as, a, as an option. Yeah. Yeah. So we can maintain that as well. Right. I've got another one with the appendices. Uh, if I'm reading this right, the hub construction costs to the right of that table total $1.1 billion. So that's to get the, the network up and running as proposed in the presentation. So yeah, the hub construction we don't see as needed on day one. No. It is something that we've introduced over the first five years, but we think it is critical to leveraging maximum efficiency out of the network. Yeah. Um, the frame, you know, it, it, yeah, the whole idea in merging the track passenger is breaking down the distances that some of these vehicles are travelling and keeping them in a smaller area, therefore allowing more frequent trips, therefore increasing the usage. Yeah. And my final one, Sorry. I'm just going through all my stickers. <laughs> <laughs> um, my final one, um, you, you touched on uh, John Hunter Hospital, Obviously, um, University of Newcastle, so you know, centres, logical centres that are significant patrons or users of public transport. TAFE, does that fit in? It is more way to take anywhere, really. In terms of the hub locations, though, they're actually sort of in specific sort of geographical locations. Mm -hmm. Like looking at both the locations in terms of the users, so you're right, so in terms of hospital, both the Callaghan and the city campus for this, but then looking at sort of regional areas that then gives us a push off point for the rest of the system to work. So Glendale, Wyomset, looking out through things. And so if you're looking at the TAFE site, um, whether it stays currently or if it gets moved elsewhere, um, then it's got the ability to be within the centre of surrounding pubs that can move directly across to it. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Penny, the Connor Valley Coal Chain Coordinator does all this integration with the uh, logistics in the region. Could you see something like this sort of being expanded and being a similar sort of system? So we started off with the hubs primarily because whether we like it or not, we have peak hours by nature of the businesses that surround us and therefore we have heavy transport usage. We can't have any more vehicles on the road at most of those times during those times because the roads are already fully congested. So we do need to have a mass transit option, an ability to group the people and shift them at a low cost, high capacity method. Right. And the hubs provide that transition to and from. Uh, it also allows us therefore to transfer you know, small freight parcels from Newcastle up to Maitland, potentially not by road, but by uh, other means to again, reduce the burden on the road, shift it off and uh, reduce the operating zone, I guess, of, of the road vehicles, giving you a higher density in that area, allowing higher frequency. So does this require some investment in that system, like the safety system between the hubs? We, outside of what's in the I guess the concept that's been put in there at this stage is to leverage off the uh, new tram contract. So there potentially could be, over time. Um, I guess it's was an area that we didn't explore fully. I guess as we started in the report, we sort of took a high level. This is what we saw it, and we focused on a couple of the bits. So. split between passenger and freight 
and you would need an app over the top that would pull it all together. So like Fast for Curious, for example, not to get too in the weeds, is just Black Bay as a sort of engine behind it and as for um, moving people and ma managing times and sequences and all that sort of stuff. So the idea there for what um, Mulu would do and Moongar sitting over the top would be it would integrate Uber, Fastway, whoever it might be, all these different services, and it would sit over the top of that and harvest those offers. So there's obviously some pretty impressive programming time that would have to go into it to make it happen, but it's not, we didn't think that that was too far stretched because I know that the price of people looking at it, one, and two, I've looked at other applications around, like if you look at Taxi Fair, AI, it pulls together all these different taxi businesses to give you a certain fare if you're from different taxi operators, right? So people are doing it, but within a silo of an existing technology. I, I mean, think, I can see um, yeah. couriers could just log on to Uber and become an Uber driver as well yes. as a cour courier. So it's, I mean, the technology, I suppose. That's the one part, but then they're side by side, and, but they're not talking to each other. Yeah. Uber's, Uber would have to integrate with but no, I'm really interested in how do you how have you thought about creating this? I mean, you you'll set up a company that develops the app mm -hmm. who that does all the negotiation yeah. with all the yeah. different groups, yeah. as well as all. I mean, there's a off, I suppose become an Uber driver. There are insurances and everything mm -hmm. else. There's and regulations associated with that. All yeah. that sort of stuff. So there, I mean, there's quite a lot of work in integrating. But in terms of a business model, how do you see um, Ma Ma Munga to, <laughs> yeah. I think in Mula, Mula and Munga, yeah, to become you know, successful in, in that way? Yeah. Well, it would put the ticket on each trip. So much like an Expedia or an Uber or whatever it would be. So it would be volume driven revenue effectively um, by taking a small slice of each trip the crew van driver would get a certain amount, but in return for, you, for the deal going through, it wouldn't go out, and I would uh, take a little small slice of revenue. So it would grow, that would be the revenue stream. That's how the pricing, the, the, um, the revenue part of it would work. So it's sort of it's a subscription model for the app, or no? Well, You're saying actually per... Or an app on use. Yeah, yeah. on use. Mm -hmm. You had some pretty angry taxi drivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, that, that happened with um, Uber anyway. Yeah, well, that was what we are trying to tap into. That you can't just, you know, if we go barreling full steam ahead, technology will change good. <coughs> well, there's always a loser from those. And, you know, I'm in commercial banking, so I see what's happening to various industries and technology will change. And some of them are going like this. And, and ta the taxi plate, for example, was worth a million dollars. All it entailed you to do was to drive a cab around and take the passengers. So the value of those is, is falling quite sharply because of technologies like Uber. No, but just see mm. if I can have one more. Yes. Just what is, yeah. So what are the three biggest challenges, do you think, to get this implemented? People buying into it, I think. You sit there and you go, there's people who make money and who have absolute control over their particular transport. Wait, well, then when you say people, can we separate it to cut patrons versus businesses? So business. Oh, yes. you're saying business. So, so business. So in terms of there's people who there's, so there's, there's corporations who make money out of the way that we move either freight or, or people around. Um, and there's there has to be it, it's, it's it is literally breaking those silos. There's going to be losers associated with that in terms of people who are making excessive amounts of money. But it's not to the benefit of the entire community. It's not the benefit to everyone. There's a, uh, obviously there's the government funding associated with the way that transport works as well now. But what we're saying is not necessarily, the system's not gonna require a bigger influx in terms of spending from the government in terms of transport. It's a reallocation of that money and using it in a smarter way to allow for this to be adapted. Um, but there's still regulations that are sort of breaking that need to happen to allow it to go through. Look, I guess my question related to that, um, in that the traditional transport modes are all quite siloed and they're regulated in, in very specific ways. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that's about things like safety and other things are about um, economic issues and, and the ability to make a living out of some of these things. What do you see in that space? Um, and even things like Uber and electronic cars or, or driverless cars are struggling with some of that now. Um, what do you see as the regulatory challenges or financial challenges in this for acceptance? Because you're talking about markets where, say, 
career growth is you know, as much driven by having to get between two places in the week as possible time. So. I think if I, I'll address safety and then I'll hand off my hours. So from the safety point of view, it's or exists internally within New South Wales for the RSI we have on the board working. This operation is still going to have to comply with all their requirements under that. Um, again, I think one of the idea of the model is, is that that regulation will still sit with the companies like Uber, etc., rather than that being the final driver of the model. Um, like with a lumper, we can't expect a final driver at the very bottom of the chain to go try and go through the process of becoming an accredited operator. Uh, whether that's rail or otherwise, that is a you know, massive cost to set up their own little company, and we would see that working more or less as it does today. So there are some silos that are hard to smash because there's a barrier to entry on the skills base or a licensing base if we can be a train driver. There's some silos very easy to smash. The freight van can take a passenger without with the same driver's license because there's just these issues around insurances. <coughs> but I think if you look at big picture, well, first of all, go back 100 years, people hated the introduction of the car, big wagon wheel didn't like it, you know, like, and so the, and there was, they played regulatory defense on that, right, to slow it down. We saw that around the world. We're seeing it now. Airbnb, all the hotel operators are screaming, they hate it, but the cities that adopt it generally like it, the consumers demand it, people learn about it. 30 years from now, we'll back them up, I think. And so, what I would think with the rollout of Mungai would be something similar, the easy, loving fruit, the career van piece, would be accepted quite quickly without too many regulatory headaches. There might be issues around insurance pricing for the van, for example, because there's another squishy human in there. Um, that we'd have to get around, or you know, they'd have to be addressed or priced in. Those sort of things that would happen. Um, some things would be hard to break the silos to train driver and so forth. But over time, those things would broken down because of just the weight of the market forces. That's all I said. So really quickly. Yeah. Thanks. You presented really well. It's good dimensions of the project. I'm <coughs> just testing the, the realism of being able to do something. So ultimately, you rely on. The, the end user's experience yep. of the process to be yep. able to continue to model it. Uh, it talked a little bit about revenue streams and about what attracts people to do it. How do you ascertain that you always have enough supply to manage the baseline? Okay. Um, well, I don't want to get you half the stuff. <laughs> yeah, okay. Do you have enough supply to manage the baseline? All right, well, the first speaking to the economist, I'd say the finance guy and say that, well, the price signals will come through there, right? And if the search pricing already in Uber's model, for example, um, that would still Uber would be sitting un under Munga, for example. And so at peak times, you would have surge pricing would occur, and then that would therefore bring supply okay. to it. Good. Right. So how do you satisfy the base? Sorry. How do you satisfy the base? How do you know that you've always got a service delivery for your your base demand that you've got no one left standing? I guess you've always got the base case of what's being provided now. The transport system, well, it's not fantastic. It, it works to a degree now, and so you've got the ability to have that as a maintained base. So anything extra that is added in, the fact that we can add in careers, we can add in trains, we can add in all these sorts of different modes of transport, is only going to then elevate the availability and the frequency of transport options. It's not necessarily going to say, okay, that means if there's only one person, then the whole system fails. It's all still got a base case, which is essentially reliant upon the public transport and then those sorts of systems that work, already exist in some form now. That and I would say that the part of the purpose of the project and the brief of the project was leveraging off the investment in light rail economy. Then all these things would happen. So a base assumption in the project is, you know, no one's going to tear up a rail line without a replacement being in place. That would be insane. But we're not getting rid of anything, right? <laughs> so we're taking existing infrastructure. We know there's a new investment coming, and then we're leveraging off that. All right, we'll have to wrap up on that. Sure. Thank you very much.